We often see folks arguing about whether or not space exploration should be done by robots or manned missions. We don't talk as much about whether or not space colonization should be done by robots, or the advantages of robots over humans. So today we will be looking at Colonizing Titan, the largest moon of Saturn and slightly larger than the planet Mercury, a claim only Jupiter's moon Ganymede can match. Yet while both are larger than Mercury, their combined mass is actually less. Both are far less dense than Mercury, Earth, or the other two inner planets, Venus and Mars. In the first two episodes of the series we looked at Mars and then Venus, one with virtually no atmosphere and the other with one far more massive than Earth's own. Genuine atmospheres are not common in our solar system, and ignoring the gas giants, you can only find them on two planets and one moon, Earth, Venus, and Titan. Unlike Venus where the atmosphere is super hot and thick and mostly carbon dioxide, Titan's own atmosphere is mostly nitrogen like our own, with an atmospheric pressure about 50% greater than Earth's. Of course you can't breathe it because there's no oxygen and because the temperature of Titan makes Antarctica look like an oven in comparison. Titan is so cold it is thought to have cryovolcanoes on it, shooting out not magma but water, molecular hydrogen, and other volatiles, which may be the reason why it has so much ethane and methane on it, and butane and propane as well. Titan has many lakes on it, but they are not water. If you wanted to think of Titan as a planet of ice covered in lakes of oil and methane seas, that would basically be on the nose, and it's maybe a good thing there's not much free oxygen around, or you could light the whole place on fire. You could walk around on Titan in a well-insulated suit and an oxygen mask, but if you stood still you'd start melting the surface where you stood, and if you went for a swim in one of those lakes, it would steam around you and boil until it eventually froze you. This is Titan the frozen, flammable gold mine of the solar system, with hundreds of times more natural gas and other hydrocarbons than Earth, with an atmosphere thick enough to allow easy aerobraking to land on, and with a gravity well similar to our own moon. It's easy to land on and easy to leave, with vast quantities of rocket fuel just lying there to suck up, add oxygen, and burn your way back to orbit. This is Titan, a place far enough away that if you are still using chemical fuels for rockets, it's probably beyond your range to make much use of, but it is there, in case we never master fusion or make dependable fission drives, it's the solar system's ultimate chemical fuel depot. And this is Titan, a place so far away from the Sun that it receives just 1% of the sunlight Earth does. It has a lot of appeal in many solar system colonization plans for its riches, and yet at the same time it is so much less tempting of a place for humans to ever colonize. We often see it as a linchpin of a future solar economy, able to provide hydrogen and nitrogen to places like Mars that have very little of either, or Venus which has plenty of nitrogen but very little hydrogen. Titan, while cold, is rich in everything you need for life except warmth, yet were you to warm it up, it lacks the gravity to hold those organic riches and if you introduced oxygen they'd soon incinerate. As we've discussed before, there is no place you cannot terraform if you want to badly enough, but it is worth asking if those things which make a place unlike Earth might actually be beneficial. So let us take up the persona of our traveler again from earlier episodes to get a human perspective. We first visited Mars and dwelt there for a decade, then came back to Borman Station in orbit around the moon, and were convinced to travel to Venus and dwelt there for many years in their floating cities. Now, once more, we are returning to Borman Station, the hub for early interplanetary travel and trade, with the intent again to see Earth once more. Things have hardly been static on Earth, Mars, or the rest of the inner solar system all these years. There are habitats scattered around Earth's orbit and mining operations on many asteroids out in the belt, some slowly becoming permanent settlements. So folks are discussing getting some genuine trade going on in the solar system, 
the long consensus is that Titan is a potentially invaluable node for such trade, but the lore of space exploration and settlement is beginning to fade a bit. The idea of flying off to Titan isn't that appealing, it used to take years to get a probe out to Saturn, ships are far faster now but it's still a long trip. When your spaceship runs on chemical fuels, you have to make almost the entire ship out of fuel and still follow the most optimum energy paths throughout the solar system. These typically involve Hohmann transfer orbits, which I'll discuss later, but they don't look anything like a straight line. Normally all the planets move so much relative to each other that it is rather pointless to think of straight lines anyway, but Saturn takes 30 years to orbit the Sun, and is almost 10 times further from it than Earth. The two planets are never closer than 8 AU, astronomical units, the average distance of Earth from the Sun, and never further than 11. That is a long way, but on the other hand, you can get a message there and back in under 3 hours, which isn't really long on normal email timelines. If a spaceship could sustain a 1G thrust constantly, it could accelerate halfway there for 4-5 to five days, flip over and slow down and arrive in about 9 days. Of course such a ship would be traveling at over 1% of light speed. This is actually quite conceivable for a genuine fusion-powered ship, indeed it is fairly modest compared to the hypothetical maximum speeds for such a vessel, but it is also quite wasteful of energy. Even such a fast ship is not traveling in a particularly straight line, and Saturn won't have moved much during that time. It's important to keep in mind though that even if you can go that fast, most of the time you won't want to. Interplanetary trade is a complex enough topic that I will give it its own episode in a month or so, but when you are engaging in bulk transport of billions of tons of raw materials, it pays to be frugal with your energy and follow those slow paths. This is essentially what Titan offers too, huge amounts of nitrogen and hydrogen and hydrocarbons all of which are in short supply in the inner solar system and needed in massive quantities for making Earth-like habitats and living areas. But here on Borman Station we find out that folks have some other ideas about what Titan might be useful for. While potential terraformers are talking about ways to warm Titan up, others are pointing out that being cold has its own benefits. At the core of all industrial and computational processes is thermodynamics and how efficient those are. Even things like solar panels that folks don't think of as having anything to do with big steam or oil-fired engines are limited by this, and the key constraint is that such engines operate on an energy transfer between two reservoirs, a hot one and a cold one. Take two equal temperature reservoirs and no work or power can be extracted from them. No engine can ever be more efficient than the Carnot heat engine, and its maximum efficiency is given as 1 minus the ratio of the cold reservoir over the hot one, with temperatures in absolute scale, typically Kelvin. Back on Earth, a heat engine whose cold reservoir was at room temperature, about 300 Kelvin, might have a hot reservoir of 400 Kelvin, a bit more than boiling water. Such an engine can produce work or power at no better efficiency than 1 minus 300 over 400, or 1 minus 3 fourths, or 1 fourth, or 25%. That is not terribly efficient. Yet that same engine running on Titan, where the average temperature is only about 100 Kelvin, is 1 minus 100 over 400, or 1 minus 1 fourth, or 3 fourths, or 75% efficient. Heat is also a big deal with computation. Computers build up ferocious amounts of heat and need massive amounts of cooling to operate, but even beyond that, Landauer's limit kicks in, which is the maximum theoretical limit for classic computing efficiency, and that is directly related to temperature. Have the temperature, double your maximum computations for the same amount of energy. I'll come back to this a little later. Now you can produce cold temperatures anywhere, but you usually have to expend considerably more energy refrigerating a warm place than it's worth. Up in space this is a bit worse, because you can only get rid of heat by radiating it away, and radiating heat is dependent on the total surface area of the object doing the radiating and the temperature it is at. 
except that scales up far faster with temperature, with the 4th power, so if you double something's temperature, it radiates away 2 to the 4th or 16 times faster. Mercury and Venus are almost 10 times as hot as Titan, and radiate 10 to the 4th or 10,000 times the energy from the same surface area. But Titan is big and cold, so you can use conventional cooling processes by running cold fluids over the hot heat generating object and cooling it, then pumping the hot fluids away. What this means is that on Titan, you can run many industrial processes and electronics at ultra high efficiency and use Titan's atmosphere as a massive space radiator. Now of course, one cannot dump an infinite amount of heat on Titan, every joule of energy you add raises the temperature a bit, but the hotter the Moon gets the more quickly it gets rid of heat. By taking its current average surface temperature, which is 98.3 Kelvin, and picking a new average temperature, say 100 Kelvin, this shows how much power each radiates off per square meter. Take their difference and multiply that against Titan's whole surface to find out what the thermal energy budget is. By doing that, the amount of power that's usable without warming the place up even more can be calculated. We'll skip the rest of the math, what's really useful is that Titan can dissipate up to 31 trillion watts, which is almost double the total power generation of humanity in the early 21st century. So in industrial terms, you could get away with running all the planetary industrial output of humanity at that time several times over again and at a far higher rate of efficiency and without having to worry about impacting Earth's climate with excess heat and other chemical pollutants. That makes Titan a potential industrial powerhouse, the Titan of interplanetary industry, because everything it does is more efficient, and it can do a lot of it. Its low gravity and thick atmosphere allows very easy transport from the surface to space and vice versa. On Borman Station folks are talking about this option, but as of yet no person has even set foot on Titan, and the furthest manned missions to date have been out to the moons of Jupiter. We haven't set foot on Earth in a generation, and plenty of fascinating things have been happening there too, so we go home to Earth and get to see all the new changes. Giant citadel arcologies with whole metropolises living inside them and still finding ample room for factories and farms and forests inside, cities floating in the ocean or snugly warm in the polar ice, cities kilometers under the sea or deep inside mountains. For all the millions of people now living in space, in orbital habitats or off colonizing planets and asteroids, many more are colonizing humanity's home, turning desert and tundra green creating structures so vast they each could have housed and fed the entirety of pre-industrial humanity. We can see why no one is rushing off to colonize Titan, there are plenty of places left still to explore on Earth, and even Antarctica in the wintertime is far more hospitable than Saturn's distant moon. Now for all that few manned missions have been far from Earth, there's been no shortage of unmanned robot missions. There is not much need to send a manned mission out to Jupiter to take ice core samples from Europa when a robot can do it cheaper and better. There's always an assumption though that a manned mission must eventually follow, certainly if you plan to colonize the place. But do colonies and outposts need people on them? Folks are able to create automated mining outposts, all done by robots who, at most, need occasional oversight from people. Does an asteroid mining facility really need any people on it? Or would it be enough just to have the crew of a ship perform some checks and maintenance on the machinery while picking up the refined cargo? Indeed does that ship even need a crew? It's not much of a leap to imagine machines that could repair themselves and handle reasonably complex tasks and problems without even considering human level artificial intelligence but you don't necessarily need the ability to repair your robots. After all, the advantage of advanced automation is that it can do most manufacturing tasks with little to no human labor and even minimal oversight, so if you have robot miners that can operate fairly autonomously, you probably have that same option for the factories making those robots back home. You don't really need to repair them, but you probably could, and you probably could automatically. 
you probably don't even need to send more probes or mining drones out either, because they can potentially manufacture everything they need to make more of themselves. I've talked before about self-replicating machines, and people tend to think of these as tiny little robots, but they hardly need to be and the first ones probably would not be, nor does each need to be able to do it on its own. A factory capable of producing every component in that factory is a self-replicating machine. You could easily imagine vast factories down in the ice on Titan, all monitored and controlled from a few manned orbital facilities, maybe occasionally sending out a team in insulated pods and suits if necessary, but do you even need people there? Would anyone even want to be there? Some may be for the eventual or potentially high pay but who would want to actually live there? So, could Titan be truly colonized in the future, with few to no people living on it, just a massive factory and computer farm taking in raw materials and energy and information and exporting material? This would be an entire moon where deep below its atmosphere, submerged under the ice and lakes, entire city-sized computers and factories exist. And while there's an energy budget to avoid melting, Where is it getting that energy? Oh, Titan is covered in the same hydrocarbons used in combustion engines, but there's no free oxygen to use it, and it takes a lot of energy to remove oxygen from water or rocks to burn it with those hydrocarbons. Uranium or thorium for fission is an option, and odds are that Saturn's 61 other known moons have plentiful supplies of those. It's very easy to move around those moons, there's very little gravity. Of course solar power would seem to be out since a solar panel near Saturn only gets about 1% of the light which one near the Earth would get, but you could put your panels at the focus of a cheap parabolic dish, just shiny plastic or metal to focus light on it. It's not like a few square meters of tin foil cost anything like as much as a square meter of solar panels, and space to put them is no problem. There's no reason to care if they orbit Titan and block what little sunlight hits the place since that would only increase the thermal budget. Or you could have little power satellites much closer to the sun that just beamed energy out to Titan, not even to the moon itself, trying to cut through that thick atmosphere. The orbital velocity around Titan is quite low, as is its gravity, so building a space elevator or an orbital ring with power lines right down to the surface is not that hard. You could even have colonies living inside of floating cities in the upper atmosphere attached to tethers that are anchored to the surface and use receivers to capture that beamed energy. And if one has viable fusion power plants, there's no shortage of hydrogen or deuterium on Titan itself. Unlike the inner planets where hydrogen tends to be too light to stick around in truly large quantities, Titan has tons, as does the planet it orbits. Most folks reject the notion of letting robots do all our exploring, and would not see a point in letting them do all colonizing, but that does not mean that every object humans colonize has to have an end state of being principally for human habitation. In the sorts of massive economies and industrial infrastructure a solar system working its way towards Kardashev 2 status might have, especially one with good automation, it's possible for an entire giant moon like Titan to be entirely colonized even if it just had a handful of folks living at the stations at the top of a space elevator, while millions of tons of raw materials and manufactured goods left up that elevator every minute. Folks talk about a future for humanity where there's far better automation, might not this be a more likely setup and use for a place like Titan than having people actually trying to live there and start up a real civilization of millions of people? Back to our story. We live on Earth for about a year, but find Earth's gravity crushing. Earth's culture is also alien to us because we've been away for so long. The final straw is when we get bad news from a doctor that we developed a rare, incurable cancer because of the decades spent without a magnetosphere protecting us. So just as one would expect of such an adventure, we decide to go back to being a pioneering colonist. A mission is planned for Titan to set up automated factories and a mega computational capability. It's very expensive setting up and maintaining people on a mission like this so only a skeleton crew will be sent to oversee the project, and mostly they are there to make sure nothing gets out of hand with Titan's manufacturing facilities and AI capability going rogue. We sign on to the mission. Artificial intelligence is now well advanced. 
I mentioned before that the fundamental theoretical limit on classical computing is called Landauer's limit, and that the colder it is the better it works too. The energy needed to flip a single bit at Titan's temperature is just one zeptojoule. A gigahertz processor could run on just one trillionth of a watt. You recall the 31 trillion watts in our energy budget for Titan. If computers use just one of those trillions, a trillion trillion gigahertz processors can be run, and it is generally believed you only need maybe 10 to 100 million to emulate a human mind. So for just a few percent of the available energy budget on Titan, there you could operate a computer able to emulate the minds of the entire human population a million times over. Even if you're nowhere near Landauer's limit, that much energy at those kind of temperatures and cooling rates allows you to run some very serious computing operations, more than enough to oversee any sort of automated manufacturing you had going on. Heck, unlike Earth whose core is mostly molten iron, Titan's core is mostly silicon, so you're hardly short of stuff to make computers out of. Folks are understandably a bit nervous about things like totally automated factories and megacomputers and artificial intelligence being set up around Titan. The skeleton crew joke that they are really just there with self-destruct devices if the Titan wakes up and starts manufacturing battleships and talking about exterminating humanity. They end up referring to it that way too, not talking about the factories or computer banks down on Titan doing that, but rather Titan itself. Most of these folks will stay in orbit around Titan, check the files coming from Earth to be run on the giant computers below and send the results back, or provide hospitality when a ship shows up bringing in metals or taking away mining equipment for other moons. Once the mission arrives at Titan, we are initially tasked with directing the robots that set up manufacturing on the moon itself and that build an orbital ring covered in huge receivers, sucking in transmissions from the inner system and sending data back launching huge pods of nitrogen and hydrogen off to Mars and Venus and the various asteroid habitats trying to build settlements and cities in space. After everything is set up, we move to overseeing day-to-day operations. Visitors occasionally want to visit Titan, and the skeleton crew always shrug and say go ahead. Nobody has made a shuttle-sized reactor, so the shuttle runs on chemical rockets and there's no shortage of fuel below. Once the shuttle lands, a visitor has to wait till things freeze back over because the shuttle's rockets evaporate and melt its landing space. Visitors are often disappointed, as they expect some sign of all the massive industry below, but there was no real need to do it on the surface. You can essentially melt your facilities down where you need them, and a lot of it's underground or under the lakes. Back on Mars, the big argument was over whether or not to colonize the planet or colonize the orbital lanes above it and just mine the planet for resources. Here, the only signs that civilization has arrived is the orbital ring above and the tether rising up to it. Occasionally you can see some barge carrying material to one of those automated ports at the bottoms of the tethers or a submarine pop up from under the lakes. It's a strange place and inhospitable but in many ways the more logical outcome of space colonization. Humans need all the moons and planets for their resources, but very few offer much reason to live there, rather than build your own habitats to your own specifications in more hospitable places, and in many ways the vacuum of space, or the inside of a modest asteroid, is more habitable. Humans could build domes here and could insulate them to leak little heat so that it didn't melt the ground they sat on and sink. They could light them so they didn't exist in the dim twilight of a lunar surface far from the sun and deep beneath an atmosphere, but ultimately, to what end? You might do a few, surely some folks will want to visit and others might be employed there, but while there is immense material wealth on Titan, You have little motivation to live there to get it if you do not need to be there to get it. Our automation gets better every day, and it doesn't really need to be that small to just build the same thing over and over again and suck up the atmosphere or scoop out ice to transport to other worlds. In an ultimate sense, Titan's key export is cold itself and all the advantages that offers, but it's not a nice place to live and to make it such a place decreases those advantages. While the notion of an entire moon the size of a regular planet being a huge automated factory and processor is somehow a little creepy, 
It is worth noting that it's not any creepier than any other deserted moon or planet, which is all of them. Titan really is an invaluable resource to colonizing the solar system, it can be a key hub of interplanetary trade, but that doesn't mean many or any people need to live there. This is a very different way of viewing colonization, much at odds with the classic image from science fiction, yet in some ways seems far more realistic. Just because humans colonize a place does not mean a lot of folks need to actually live there, and just because a lot of folks don't live there does not mean it is not colonized. The skeleton crew occasionally head down to the surface of Titan, but after the excitement of the first couple of trips, all of them prefer to live in the orbital ring rather than in the hazy twilight on the freezing surface. Unlike them, we are perfectly happy and at home on the surface of Titan, and it's not because we've been colonizing for decades, but rather it's because we are not a member of the skeleton crew. Instead, we were one of a number of people who uploaded their consciousnesses into an AI core before leaving Earth and are now housed in the Titan supercomputer. As I said earlier, folks were worried about an AI running amok, and it was felt that using an AI that was allowed to self-develop was a bad idea. Instead, human volunteers were found to cross the digital divide and become transhuman AIs. That was seen as a lot safer for all concerned, it was just the sort of thing that appealed to us as the next frontier. An entire industry has subsequently developed where people, tired of corporeal life or unable to continue with corporeal existence, decide to upload their consciousnesses into the Titan megacomputer, so we are now far from alone and the surface of Titan has become a colony of a different sort, one that has lots of humans existing in it but one that, at the same time, has no flesh and blood humans at all. Over time, Titan could house more virtual humans than all the flesh and blood humans in the entire solar system, including colonies and Earth itself. Despite its hostile alienness, Titan could be the biggest home of humanity. That doesn't mean you can't have quite a large colony of flesh and blood people around gas giants, those gas giants and their many moons can form a surprisingly self-sustainable civilization like a miniature solar system, one where travel to and from is quick and easy and communications are fast enough you can chat with your lunar neighbors real time. That's something we'll examine more in the next episode of the series when we look at colonizing Jupiter and we'll look at colonizing those moons and forming such a mini solar system with an extra focus on Jupiter's icy moon Europa and its subterranean oceans, as well as discussing how we could colonize a gas giant itself, not just its moons. Before we get to that we will take some time to examine the idea of interplanetary trade in a bit more detail, and even interstellar trade concepts. We'll be looking at a lot of the classic ideas from science fiction and seeing how plausible they are, and if not, what our alternatives are. A pretty crucial part of that is going to be Hohmann Transfer Orbits, or HTOs, and the Interplanetary Transport Network, and it's vital to trade for places like Titan where most of the exporting is going to either be data moving at light speed or huge quantities of raw materials and bulk durable goods moving slowly from place to place in automated vessels. Hohmann transfers are crucial to modern space travel and will continue to be even if we get awesome high-tech engines. I've been meaning to discuss Hohmann transfers for a long while, but keep flinching back from it since it would require us to walk through examples to really understand it, and that's best done at the individual's own pace. But if you want to know how slingshot maneuvers and HGOs actually work and be able to look at them the way a rocket scientist does, then I recommend that you check out Brilliant.org, our newest partner. They just put out an entire course on the dynamics of orbits, including a project where you learn the physics of the HTO as you design your own mission to Mars, which I found remarkably straightforward and intuitive, and I recommend that you check it out. I can never overemphasize how handy that math and science skill set is to have in your mental toolbox, because of all the extra layers of concepts it opens up for you to explore, and Brilliant is a great place to do that. They have got everything an aspiring space traveler would need, 
from classical mechanics to differential equations to their new course on astronomy. You can dive right in at whatever your skill level is and explore at your own pace. To support the channel and learn more about Brilliant, go to Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. That is the subscription I've been using to explore concepts like HTO. A couple weeks back we looked at the notion of uplifting, enhancing animal minds to the human level, and next week we'll be looking at some of the ways you might be able to do that or enhance the human mind to superintelligence in Mind Augmentation, a concept explored in our October Book of the Month, Revelation Space by Alastair Reynolds. We'll be looking at that topic and some of the themes explored in that novel. For alerts when that and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.